Char, thank you so much for being here. Thank I, you for having me. Oh, 100%. Uh, when when my, my team started saying, okay, who could we bring in? Who could we bring in that, that could actually have an impact on people? I was like, definitely reach out to Bashar. I remember the first time we met, this was, uh, I guess it was like last year in October, right? In, at, in Boise? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, Bashar, the, the purpose of this, this whole uh, uh, podcast uh, uh, environment that we have here is sure. really to give business owners a vicarious opportunity to learn through others. But some of the things I, I think are most in, informative and impactful are things that have happened in our past. Right. And I'd like to try and jump into a little bit of your past as well, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, I mean, h- how far do you want to go? We're going to go all the way back. I want to I learn, who was, who was young Bashar? Like, tell me a little bit about, about your growing up experience. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. You guys got an awesome space here. Congrats for everything you guys have done. Um, you know, I was always, I admired my father a lot. So in the, um, in the late 70s, 80s, and also early 90s, my dad was, uh, he owned the second largest factory of clothing in Iraq. That's oh. where I'm originally from. Okay. And, uh, and he made his, his way into kind of the, um, the ranks through, uh, 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 he was an accountant uh, just by like learning how to do accounting and not okay. actually going to school. Okay. And uh, all of his brothers were actually accounting, uh, accountants by, you know, by degree. They oh, went okay. to school, but he just, he was the only one that didn't do it. And he actually had the largest job out mm-hmm. of all of them. Okay. And, um, and so after he, uh, um, he had been doing that for a few years, um, he was approached by one of his friends and said, hey, you know, I, I, uh, there's this company, this clothing factory that there's 31, um, you know, uh, uh, 31 partners. They don't know what they're doing. Would you come in and just clean up the books? Six months after, he had bought everyone out, including his friend that brought him in and took the company uh, uh, to about 600% in growth in about six months. Wow. Right? And then from there, he just kind of took off. And like mid-80s, he had a net worth of about $40, $50 million. But then in 91, the Gulf War of uh, uh, Iraq and Kuwait happened, and uh, the uh, the economy just went sideways. And the Iraqi uh, dinar used to be one dinar for three U.S. dollars. Yeah. It turned to one U.S. dollar equaling 1,200 dinars. Oh my so my dad goes from a multimillionaire to zero overnight. And so as I grew up, he, to me, in my eyes, he was always a mover, a shaker. He was always someone that was like looked up to in the community. His brothers and sisters looked up to him. Everyone that we knew looked up to him. And I always wanted to become like my dad. Okay. You know, that was the person. Whenever I think about my dad, even now think about it, I get goosebumps. I see this, this like this just, you know, perfect haired man, you know, cool mustache, just sitting right there in a, in a, in a fancy chair, full suit, you know. Obviously, I don't dress like him. I, did, I didn't take that, you know. I didn't get that. Um, and But, like, when he says something, people do, you know. Okay. Like, I don't want to say it in a bad way where, like, he bosses people around, but, but more of, respect. like, right, he had respect, definitely. Okay. And especially in the Middle East, you know, people in power really were in power, yeah. you know. Um, and, and so I always had that picture in my mind. I always wanted to become like him. And it was, for, for me, it was an entrepreneur traveling because it was always traveling, doing over. business, you know. And that's what I really wanted to do. Okay. Um, and, 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 you know, as I was growing up, I obviously was too young to really do anything. Uh, but then in 2003, when the war in, um, on Iraq happened, uh, the U.S. Army the US coming Army. in, uh, uh, um, that's when everything became very turbulent in my life and my family's life. Um, you know, looking at us from outside, you would see, you would see that we are very wealthy because my dad had all these properties. We had a very nice home, Mm -hmm. but then we were very cash poor because he didn't have a cash flowing business. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I grew up pretty much, um, never really having anything. Like I always looked at my friends Mm -hmm. and how they always got the nice presents and the toys and all that stuff. And I never had any of this. Mm -hmm. Um, I would only get new clothes on Christmas and I would only have like a tiny budget that I can go in and and buy clothes with. And I would always see my friends where like on their birthdays, they got new stuff. Randomly, their dads got new stuff. And you look at them and you look at us and it's like, they're living in a one bedroom apartment. We're living in this like, you know, two story, huge home. So to me, it was always like, there's a problem here. What is going on? Um, but I always wanted to grow up to become like my dad. Okay. When, when you look at, at your schooling then during this time frame, because 
obviously with the the 92 invasion uh, i think it was 92 uh, it was right? 91, 91 and then 92. 2003 okay yeah so <clears throat> how did how did that transition impact your schooling like how, how did everything that was unfolding impact sure. your, your studies so I was born in 90, uh -huh. so the 91 wasn't really, wasn't didn't, three, didn't yeah, have a big impact on me at all, but the 2003 did, because I was okay. 13 years old. Okay. I was, uh, you know, uh, uh, middle school going into high school, mm -hmm. and so we had to, to leave Iraq for a little while. We went to Jordan, Jordan okay. and then I lived there for about six months, and I tried to go to school there. Absolutely different school system. Mm. But then especially after we migrated into America mm -hmm. in 2006, that was a completely different situation because mm -hmm. now we went from, you know, I, I, I was born and raised in, the, in a country where I knew everyone, friends, everything. Mm -hmm. Now I go into another country where it's a new culture. It's a new language that I don't speak. Mm -hmm. We didn't, although we kind of started learning English in schools, bit. but I didn't really know anything. You know, mm -hmm. I couldn't even make it like through, you know, through security check. Wow. And, um, and so it was very difficult for me um, coming to the, to the country Learning, you know, being able to to uh, um, to make friends, mm -hmm. you know, hairstyle was different. The way I dressed was yeah. different. Kids were just making fun of me for whatever reason, you know. And I and I started, you know, seeing some girls that I was really attracted to, and but I couldn't like explain myself. I couldn't express my feelings, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was really uh, uh, frustrating for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, my my middle school years, my high school years. Um, were definitely very tough in the beginning because it, it just I was trying to fit in still, you know. Mm -hmm. mm. Finding finding your space, like did you did you get to a point where you found your footing in in, in the school system here? So oh six oh six oh six, we migrated into America. We went to Detroit first, okay. And I still remember the first morning waking up and like hearing and and you know like you're still halfway asleep, halfway awake, and I hear in the background like English, mm -hmm. and I was like. Am I dreaming? Am I watching a movie? What is going on right now? Because yeah. growing up, we always watched American movies and stuff like that. Right, right. And then so I peek um, uh, uh, above the bed, and it's the window, and it goes on the street. We were staying at my uncle's house because mm -hmm. my uncle we actually had an uncle that lived in Detroit, mm -hmm. and um, and I see it's almost it seemed like from this like perfect like American movie. It's uh, 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 they lived in this uh, subdivision of homes that were like. The houses were so perfect. The, the 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 lawn was like so perfect, and I see this father pushing his son or daughter on the bike, like they were learning how to ride wow. a bike, and it was just this like perfect scene, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm just looking like, wait, is this reality right now? Am I really here? Right. And once I realized that I was really here, to me that was uh, uh, kind of like a, not. It was a, a it was a. a, a, a it was a good moment, but a bad moment at the same time. Okay. And a, a good moment because I knew that I was safe. Okay. Because three years prior, after the invasion, mm -hmm. um, we thought that, like, we were very happy because now Saddam is gone, right, you know, right, right. we're going to be good. My dad owned all these properties that he couldn't sell. And now it's like, all right, now we're going to start liquidating or, you know, uh, co American companies are going to come in. He had a couple buildings that were, like, downtown Baghdad. Perfect. And so we were going to do great. And for the following three years, it just went like 50,000 times worse. Because instead of having one Saddam, now there's 50,000 Saddams, yeah. and there's militias, and there's this, and there's that. And then, um, and so there was like killing on the streets, bombs, oh you know, goodness. car bombings everywhere, and all that stuff. And so it just became very unsafe. Mm -hmm. You know, like there would literally be, there was a, a, a U.S. military base, maybe like half a mile away from us. Mm -hmm. And what they would do, uh, some like militias, they would come at the end of our street. They would come in like a pickup truck, put uh, rocket launches, uh, launchers in the back of their pickup truck, you know, launch a few rockets and then take off. Oh, and sometimes gosh. those wouldn't go right and they would land into people's homes. Oh, and so you're sitting down and you hear the sound. It's like, holy shit, is it about to land in my living room? Right. You know? And so it's like, well, what do I do? And that was everyday life. And so after doing that for three years, we realized that, you know, there is no future here. And my dad realized that we need to get the hell out of here. Yeah. So he sent me and my brother. My mom was already in America for a couple of years now. Yeah. Um, so he sent us out. And then I started going to school, to high school, Detroit, first year. Start making friends just a little bit. And then this a is year. 2006, 2007. This is 2006, 2007. 2007 comes around July. My mom says, we're going to move to California. Why? Well, because we have some relatives there. It's also warm because my mom is, you know, a little older. It's Detroit. Joint pain. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. And then we went from 120 degree weather right, to, to, to like Detroit. You know what I mean? 
And so, um, and now I'm like, dude, I finally started learning English. I finally started making friends. Now right. you gotta remove me again from this environment. Like that sucks. Yeah. And I remember just being very frustrated and getting very angry at my mom. Like, why are you guys doing this to me? You know, mm -hmm. I need to kind of find my groove and like fit in already, you know? Mm -hmm. And so now there was a whole nother cycle of right. like trying to learn how to fit in. And I go to California by the time I got adapted to Detroit and, and, and East Coast, you know, uh, like how you dress and how you talk and stuff like that. Uh, West Coast, absolutely different. Totally different. Yeah. Completely different. Now people are looking at me like, what is wrong? Why are you dressing like that? You know? Yeah. So now I have to fit in. And then there's also, now I have cousins that drive BMWs as a 10th grader and 11th yeah, yeah, grader. Yeah. And I am coming in like a nobody. Mm -hmm. And so that was another struggle because mm -hmm. I wanted to hang out with the cool kids. But then when you hang out with the cool kids, you got to spend that like a cool kids. You got to roll to high school like the cool kids roll because that's what girls want. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was like, all right, I can't afford to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm, I start working at McDonald's and that was like, I was like ashamed of working at McDonald's. Like I wasn't going around telling people that I work at McDonald's because my cousins, you know, worked at daddy's liquor store or whatever. Right, you know right. what I mean? And they're getting paid a couple thousand dollars a month as a 16, 17 year old. Mm. Yeah. When you look at, at getting towards the end of your high school years. Like yeah. When you ventured, you went off to university? Um, right away? Yes or? and no. Okay, no, tell, I, tell I went. Tell me about that. Yeah, so my mom wanted me to become a, become a doctor because okay. uh, my sister was a lawyer. She wanted okay. to have a doctor and a lawyer, you know, okay. so she can show off to her sisters uh -huh. and her friends, you know. Um, but, and then she also knew that my dad was going to save the day mm -hmm. because he was, at the time, he was 70-something, you know, she was 60-something. Mm -hmm. And so she knows that, like, even if he sells his properties and brings some money here, it's like, what is he going to start another business? He right, doesn't speak right. the language. He doesn't know the culture. He doesn't know anything. And so she realized that, you know, for her, the only tool that you've got is a degree. It's the children. Right. Yeah. And it's the degree, you know. Mm -hmm. And so how do you do it? Become a doctor. And so she sold me on the idea that I need to become a doctor. And I, for the longest time, I thought I was becoming a doctor. I even bought a coat with my, you know, doctor tattoo on it. Okay. You know, and, and I went all out, you know. And I started, um, to, I went to community, I, I finished high school a semester early so I can start college Okay. And I went to college, uh, 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 and I started taking prerequisites to go then go get my bachelor's degree and then pre-med and then go to medical school. Okay. But then I realized after about six to eight months that I wasn't interested in it. Hmm. And so I switched my, my uh, major. And I probably over the, the following, like here, I switched my major at least half a dozen times. Wow. Because I just couldn't find something that I'd be curious in. Okay. I'd go to the library, I would sit down, look at the books, and try to read, and... A fly interest. would pass like a mile away and I would just like turn around. Mm -hmm. And for me, I thought I was unfocused. Mm -hmm. And this is another thing we can get into if you want. It's the whole labels that we put on ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, procrastinator, unfocused, uh, lazy. It's not that. You're just uninspired. Yes. That's all I was. I was uninspired. I just could not find inspiration in books mm -hmm. and in college. And so I finally decided around that time we had bought our first uh, business in America. I decided that I was going to drop out. Yeah. And how did that conversation go with your family? So, um, it, my, especially my mom found out about six, seven months after. Oh, after you had already After I out. dropped out. Okay. Uh, because uh, in 2011, we bought our first um, uh, business in America. So, my dad had now liquidated some properties, Came here. brought some money here, okay. and uh, we bought our first um, uh, uh, business, local pizzeria. It was uh, my mom, my 60 some year old mom, 76 year old dad. My brother and I working, you know, seven days a week, open close, mm -hmm. and um, and it was doing was doing very well. We were probably making like seven, eight, nine thousand dollars a month in profits. It was yeah. great, you know. Yeah. Having been in America for five years, your own business, like you're living pretty good. Absolutely. And um, and I was leaving every day for three, four hours to go to school. Okay. And then that became well, I'm gonna now go and hang out with girls or whatever because now I'm I've dropped out of school until I just decided to come to mom and say, hey, look. The way I've dropped out of school, and I mean I could just see the the disappointment in her, and it wasn't the disappointment; it was the fear. Mm -hmm. She almost saw me like 20 years from now, probably in a trailer park, absolutely just got nothing in my name, mm -hmm. and that like this business isn't going to do it for you. Your dad probably won't be able to do it for you, and that was your only ticket out, mm -hmm. and you've just wasted it. So you're pretty screwed. How did that like? How did that conversation make you feel though? Because you obviously made the decision that you were going to do it. Yeah. Because you didn't have the inspiration in the books. Yeah. 
So you made a decision, you carried it out, yeah. then you eventually confessed it to the family. Like, yeah. how did that conversation make you feel? You know, um, so at first I was fearful okay. and I was ashamed. Mm. And I was, I saw the disappointment in my mom's eyes. And for a little while I did feel disappointed okay. in me that I had actually gotten there. Mm -hmm. But after I went away, I actually felt relief. Okay. Because I knew that I was, cheating myself mm -hmm. and I knew that I wasn't being fair to myself and I knew that I wasn't being fair to my mom because I knew that if I kept on going, I'm not going to become a doctor because I'm convinced in my mind that I'm not going to become a doctor. Mm -hmm. And so whatever I'm going to do, I'm just going to waste time. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I'm going to do something that's not going to satisfy anybody. Okay. So for me, it was just coming to the, to the conclusion and to the, to the, the decision that, Hey, look, it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. You just got to make the decision and do it, you know? And so that's what it came down to. So you're in, you're in your early 20s at this point. Yeah, I was uh, about 21, 20, 21. 21. That's, a, that's a very mature decision to be able to make. Like to say, okay, I, I have an understanding that the outcome on this path is not the outcome I want. Mm. I'm going to abandon that path. I'm going to go down a different path. So one, that's a maturity level that a lot of twenty early 20-year-olds... 20 sure don't have. Yeah. What do you think instilled that maturity in you to be able to make that decision? Um, a few things. I think my background. Okay. Um, so a couple of things. First, to help me make that decision, it wasn't like I had a bunch of friends that were going to school. Mm -hmm. All of my cousins who were my friends were all dropouts. Okay, they're all. So for me, it was a very easy decision. Like, okay, okay and then their dads were very rich and they were going to go the same path and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I'm like... All right, you know, this is easy. Okay. Um, but then the maturity one is um, growing up in a, in a country where there is no true school system that gives two shits about you. Right. There, is no, um, there is no opportunity. There is no like, yeah, I can plan for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. And there are people that have gone this path and I can follow that path and then become someone. Uh, seeing my dad going from this to this overnight was a very scary thing oh, goodness, because yeah. it's like, you know, I could be working, busting my ass for the next 20, 30 years and the same thing can happen to me. Mm -hmm. And so this is where it became, you know, very evident to me that I need to start making my own decisions. And then also, you know, I love my dad, but he wasn't the dad that's going to show up to your soccer practice. Right, right. Not that there was soccer in Iraq and that we went to that anyways, yeah. but... He just wasn't that kind of dad. You know, he was busy with work and he was busy. He was very like business oriented. And, and my mom was a stay home mom. And so she worried about the kids and stuff like that, you know? And so almost every single, like we have four, we're four siblings. Almost every single one of us have kind of like gone a completely different route. And like we, like we have nothing similar in like career paths or, or futures or any of that. We're very different. Okay. Um, and I feel like a lot of it has to do with a, a kind of a, um, like a, um, a missing father figure in those early on years and, and, and that he wasn't involved in the raising the kids and like, no, you're supposed to do this. Don't do this. Don't talk bad or back to your mom. Like if your mom says this, do that, you know, it was more like dad came home, you know, he's like the, the, the guy that's going to spoil everybody and there is no discipline. There is none of that, you know? Whenever he was available, okay. yeah. When so now you're you're in a situation where you've made a decision. Yeah, working in the family uh, pizzeria at this point. Right. What was the next step? How long did you stay in the pizzeria role? Yeah, so that's uh, that's where the the next chapter of my life comes, okay. and that's the most impactful chapter of my life. Okay. Uh, twenty three to twenty five. Okay. Um, so I, um, my brother and I had, he's, uh, my older brother. So there are gaps. My oldest brother is 54 and I'm 32, Okay. you know? Um, and, uh, so my older brother is nine years, uh, uh older than me. Okay. And, uh, we were the ones that were running the business. Mm -hmm. And so we had the idea of like, look, let's, let's buy a bunch of, you know, pizzeria, similar business model. Okay. And then let's, um, let's learn different systems and then franchise and then like create one wow. unique look and then franchise it and blow it up. Okay. And I wanted to go 175 miles an hour. He wanted to go two and a half miles per hour. Oh. And so we kept on butting heads and because he was the older, the business was under his name. The money was like, he was the business owner. Right. 
And I kept on getting treated like an employee. And I'm like, dude, that's, that doesn't work. We need to be partners. No, we are partners, but well, you don't listen to me, you know? And so it got to the point where I was like, I just don't see us, like, I don't see us building this. We don't see eye to eye. And so I told my dad, I'm like, look, I want, I'm going to, I want out, you know? It's like, all right. Uh, around the time, again, my dad had liquidated some properties mm -hmm. and he said, here is 200K transferred into my account, 255,000 to be exact. Okay. And he said, this is your college fund because your mom wants, me, wants you to become a doctor. Mm -hmm. You can either take that money and go invest it in, in becoming a doctor or do whatever else with it, which would be opening your own business. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why sometimes I think about why my dad was so willing to do that with me, it's because all of my other siblings, when they grew up, dad was very rich. Mm. And dad gave them everything they wanted. Yeah. Brand new cars. Whatever when no one drove in Iraq, his kids had cars at yeah. like 18, 19. Mm. In the 80s in Iraq, that does not exist, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but when I, when I was, you know, when I was born, when I was raised, dad was nobody. Right. And so I feel like deep down, he almost kind of felt bad and he wanted to like make up for that, you yeah. know? So that was pretty much his last like, 200k or something and he sent it to me and he said look i trust you this is this is you and i said dad i got you i'm gonna be the guy that's going to take care of the family i'm gonna retire you and mom i'm gonna just take us to a whole nother level and so i decided to um to start my own business and and because i had only worked in restaurants mm -hmm. i'd worked at two different mcdonald's i had uh, worked at a greek restaurant for three years and then our pizzeria, pizzeria. you know mm -hmm. that was uh, i was there for about a year and a half two years and, um, and so it just made sense for me to go in that. And then I, from 20 to 23, I was partying seven days a week. Okay. And I was like, if I can find a place where I can party and like run and make money, it's like perfect. <laughs> you know, I can have my friends and I can, you know, our girlfriends and all that, like perfect. Yeah. The classic you, downfall. Of don't all do that. Food service don't businesses. do that. <laughs> um, so I found this rundown restaurant in okay. Lakeside, California. And, um, the vision in my mind until today, I think was incredible. Okay. The execution, not so much. Not so much. I had been following uh, John Taffer from Bar oh, Rescue. Oh, Bar Rescue. I remember for that. For six that. months. I think that's still on, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I stopped watching guy. it. I remember the guy. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought I was an expert. I would literally watch TV show, a reality TV show, and take notes oh, goodness. on how to run oh, a goodness. successful restaurant. Oh, Okay. And I did that for six months and I said, I got this. Okay. Right. And this is kind of the, the downfall that I see a lot of people now with YouTube. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll watch a bunch of YouTubers. Oh, I know how to do this. 100%. And then they go launch a business and it thinks, oh, he's a scammer. Mm -hmm. No, buddy, he's not. He's, he just didn't do it right. Exactly. And so with me, it was John Taffer. Okay. So I can say, well, John Taffer is a scammer. No, he's running a freaking reality, reality TV, TV show. show. You know what I'm saying? He's very good at what he yeah, does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's very good. He's like, I don't know, he's like uh, rescued like 500 bars or something like that. But at least on, on air, right. we have no idea what happened. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, I go and buy this place mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm, you know, this, 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 you know, 23 year old kid driving at the time. Uh, I still love that car. A, a CTS Cadillac coupe. Mm -hmm. It had just come out a couple years, okay. you know, and, uh, and I was just this hot shot. Um, you know, going to this place and it was a, was a rundown dive bikers bar okay. talking about big dudes that did not like people that looked like me. Okay. And, uh, and I was just in the wrong town and the wrong, everything was about me was wrong, everything. you know? Okay. And so I go there for three years, I actually went by Sean because they couldn't pronounce my name. Really? Yeah. So my name was Sean. And actually when I first, the first, very first video I ever made on YouTube in 2018 or 19 was, Hey, this is Sean Ketu. And then I deleted it like 30 minutes later. I'm like, no, no. I'm the shark Ketu. Exactly. You know? And so anyways, going back to that, I, I uh, started the business and it was, it didn't take in, about six months into the, the, the business. What, what year was it that it was? 2013. Uh, 13. So yeah. 2013, you, you basically bought this, this yes. biker bar yes. type of location. Then you started to, to try to put into practice what John Taffer taught you on TV. That's right. Okay. So I bring a, a, a bar consultant. I bring this, and I'm just like, okay, this is what he does. This is what I'm going to do. Okay. Right? So trying to do it right, you know? And uh, it, it only takes about six months that I realized that I don't know shit. Uh -huh. Because I was driving to the restaurant in the morning, and Trish, her name was, she was our uh, bar manager, get a call. Hey, Bashar, uh, the bank just called and said that my check bounced. 
I'm like, check balance. The hell are you talking about? I've got like tens of thousands of dollars in the bank. I log in and sure, I don't have tens of thousands. I'm like negative a couple thousand dollars. And I'm like, wow. where the hell did all the money go? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and the, the, the next blow was about a few nights after I was meeting with, um, with my contractor to design the place. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was expecting $50,000 because that's what I had told him that I want to spend on the remodel. The budget. Mm -hmm. Not that I had the 50,000, but and that's what you were willing, what to, I was willing to figure to, out. Yeah. How it comes up with it. And he came up with 275,000. Wow. And I remember that night I was sitting in my chair. It was 10 o'clock after everyone left and I was on the phone with him. It's like, Hey buddy, you still there? And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, I couldn't even talk right. and I can't even swallow. I'm like, you know, you feel that you feel like the whole that, world is just wow, falling, you know? Yes. And I'm just sitting there and it's dark at night. It, there's no one in the restaurant. You can hear crickets outside. And I'm just like, holy shit. I, at the time I was, I had probably like a few hundred dollars in the bank and I had a restaurant that I've put in everything into it. I'm thinking this is my dad's last money. I put it in here and there's no way out. What the fuck do I go? Right. Like, well, I can't back out because no one's going to buy this place the way it looks. Right. Um, I can't go forward because, you know, I, I have no money to go forward. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty much stuck here. Mm -hmm. And this is when I realized that I was in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. that, that, that sense of overwhelm? Yeah. Did it create inaction? Or what did you do like from that point? So first of all, I was a 23-year-old kid that had no mm -hmm. experience in life. Um, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Okay. All I knew was hard work. Okay. So I was, for three years that I owned that place, I worked 120 hours a week. Easily, probably. Yeah. And um, I would literally get home at four o'clock in the morning, leave at nine o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew this was seven days a week. Wow. Um, so I, that's all I knew. So the next step was thanks, but no thanks. Yeah. Call up a few friends, call up my brother and my cousin. We're doing this. Come help me you know? put this together. Yeah, so for the next 45 days, I would work, open, close. Mm -hmm. They would come. We would remodel overnight. We would clean, open, close, and then go home and sleep. Wow. And I would do that at least twice a week. I'm talking about 46 to 48 hours yes. before I sleep. And so I did that for about 45 days. I learned, I mean, I could probably help you build this place <laughs> myself. You exactly, know? right? Yeah, uh, I mean, I laid. I knew how to lay tile, frame walls. Mm -hmm. I mean, you name it, I did it, you know? And, uh, and luckily, uh, my cousin, uh, had, ha had been a handyman for the longest time and he knew, you know, he knew, uh, most of everything. He hooked us up with a few of his friends that did favors and stuff like that. And we turned the place around. I, I, I when I had discussions with, with entrepreneurs that have hit significant milestones of success, one of the th key ingredients I see in them is they're just willing to do whatever it takes yeah. to get it done. Yeah. And that's what you did. You yeah. rolled up your sleeves, you did whatever it took to just at least get through that period of your life. Yeah. That was for about three years, right? Yeah, and, and, and just something for the listener, I had never l nailed anything to the wall before. Right. And now I was remodeling a 3,700 square foot restaurant. Yes. Everything, wow. end to end, kitchen, you know, bathrooms, everything. I mean, everything got to go, you know? I actually can appreciate exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Because I know what that remodel, what, what 1,100 square feet feels like to remodel. Yeah. You went through that entire space on yeah. your own, literally on your own with with family members yeah. to get it done. Yeah, that's a, how did you make how did you make yourself get through that? Like how did you do that? Honestly, it was uh, the um, uh, Tony Robbins talks about this thing of uh, the pull and the push, and he says if you have if you like you need to have, in order for you to keep going in life, you need to have something in the future that's pulling you. Okay. Because if you, otherwise you're going to need to keep pushing. What was the thing pulling? The thing pulling was my parents. Okay. It was the life that I promised. For them. For them. And that's okay. why I always talk about the why. Okay. The why, like people ask me all the time, hey man, I'm trying to start a business. What why? should I, like wh where should I start? What, what should I do? I'm like, be clear on your why. Mm -hmm. And they're expecting like something tactical. Right. And I'm like, be clear with why, with the, your why. And then you just see their face like, what the fuck is this guy talking about right now? Mm -hmm. Be clear about your why. Because that's going to be the thing that when you get off the call with your contractor at 10 o'clock at night mm -hmm. and he's telling you they need 250K and you thought it was 50K and you've got like negative 2K in the bank. Yeah. That's going to be where it's like, fuck it. I'll just figure it out some other way. Mm 
mm-hmm. you know? And I know I'm not alone here. I know you've been oh, through yeah. it, you know, similar stuff. And everyone else listening to this has been through similar stuff. But it's about the thing that's in the future that's mm-hmm. pulling oh, you. Man. And it's, it can't be something that's pushing because you're going to keep pushing every morning. You have to motivate yourself. Mm-hmm. And then any little thing, you'll get down on yourself, you know? Mm-hmm. So it has to be something so big in the future and so clear. And you understand, you resonate. And it's like, yes, I want this. And it's got to pull you every day. Now, did you already have that knowledge base going into that experience? Or is this something now you're looking in retrospect and saying, wow, now I've learned what, how I got through it? Yeah, it was, it was honestly just... Yeah, it was just, I don't know. I, I don't know. It was watching movies, listening to people. I don't know. I just, I guess it clicked. It just, it, yeah, I guess it, it was made, natural. It I don't know. I don't know you. what it was. It just made sense. And again, because the why was just so large, and it's not like I knew that my why needs to be, you know, I, it's not like I knew that. Now looking back, it's like, yeah, absolutely. If I start something, I need to be clear about my why. Right. But then, you know, it was because I had that. Mm-hmm. You know, I had that anchor. Right. You know what I mean? And so, no, I, I hadn't learned that anywhere. I, I hadn't, you know, but I think the, um, when you come from nothing mm-hmm. and you've experienced absolute bottom that you don't want to go back there. Yeah. And this is where like, you've got to just burn your ships and go all for it. You know, you go, you got to go all in. Looking at, at that transition then for you, the three years obviously wasn't the most pleasant time for you, but you no. Oh, it. the story doesn't stop there. The story actually gets a lot more interesting, okay. but yeah, I, I'll, let, let's I'll let you, I'll it. let you lead me there. Let's, let's <laughs> jump into it. So, so you, you, you are in this environment that yeah. you, you've now realized that you have no idea what you're doing yeah. running this, this business. What was the next major challenge that you faced? Um, well, April 28th, 2015. Okay. Um, I leave the restaurant Five o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. I leave res- the restaurant. Was a Tuesday. I leave the restaurant to go and meet with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. Okay. This was 2015, so seven years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had met uh, in July of the f- the previous year, so we had been together for about I don't know seven eight months. Okay. Um, my phone rings. Is John? Hey John. Hey boss. The kitchen is on fire. I need you back here. Oh, my goodness. I was like, all right, well, we've got an extinguisher in the kitchen. Put it out. How bad is it? He's like, no, no, no. You don't understand. We're all outside. The fire department is here. I was like, oh, my goodness. Oh, shit. So I text my girlfriend. (laughs) Yeah, I I text my girlfriend. I'm like, hey, something's happening at the restaurant. I got to go. I go back. I, as I'm coming down the freeway, you could see the restaurant from the freeway. Okay. And all I see is smoke. Oh, my goodness. And so I'm driving my car and I'm stuck at the ramp mm-hmm. and I see smoke coming out of my restaurant. So just imagine what I'm feeling. I'm sitting there like I'm, I'm like honking. I'm going crazy. I'm like move out of my way. And I'm, it, it just feels like the life is coming out of me. I feel like my soul is coming out and it just wants to go there and find out what's going on. Right. And I knew it was bad. It just looked bad. It sounded bad. It was bad. And I knew it was bad. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you why. To me, it was a lot worse than what the picture looks. Okay. So I get there, about seven or eight fire engines outside, and I'm trying to run inside, and then the fire marshal's like, whoa, where are you trying to go? Who the hell are you? I'm like, I'm the owner. He's like, well, you got to stay out here, buddy. We're still not done. And then I just see all these firefighters coming out filled with smoke, with like, you know, drywall in their hand. This guy's throwing this thing out there. Oh, this. Th- I'm like, what are they doing right now? And... The building was built in like 1800s or something. So it was a historical building. Uh, Because of the fire was, you know, went up in the ceiling, they had to tear up the ceiling to make sure that like it's not spreading to neighbors and all that, you know? And um, so they just tore up the place. Although the fire didn't really make that much damage, but they just tore up the place, you know? And so I'm just sitting there and I'm just, all these thoughts are coming to my mind. And Steve walks in. Steve is my landlord who I haven't paid in about three months. And he's like, well, I mean, hey, man, you wanted the fresh start. You know, it hasn't been going that well. Trust me, insurance is really good at this stuff. I'm like, Steve, like what? I'm like, I haven't paid insurance in three months. Oh, no. And he's like to me, what? I'm like, I'm totally fucked, Steve. And he looks at me and he goes, oh, you're fucked. And Steve walks away. And Steve is just like, you know, all these people that he knows, you know, because he owns properties in, in, in in the community and all that. And Steve is like cussing me out and like, you know, going crazy because now he's responsible for the shit. And um, as that's happening, my dad is walking in and my dad overhears Steve. 
my dad is like, what's wrong with your landlord? Why is he, he doesn't speak very well English, but so he didn't understand what they were talking about. It's like, why is your landlord going crazy? I mean, whatever happened, unfortunately. And um, I don't know if it was my brother or someone else said something about no insurance. And then you just look at my dad. My dad looks at me, and he caught what, like he caught the he picture. He understood that. And he looked at me, and then his eyes just open up, and you can feel like he's about to like come out and like strangle me. Uh -huh. He's like, "You don't have insurance in Chaldean in our language." Mm -hmm. I'm like, no. And that moment, like, I just playing it, I always get emotional, and 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 uh, just thinking about it, um, that was probably the worst moment of my life ever, yeah. you know, because it wasn't just about the fire. See. This was two months after we had, for the second time, remodeled the place. So the first time that I told you about, we had remodeled it. Mm -hmm. Place blew up, and then it crashed. Mm -hmm. Because I was all about making things look pretty, mm -hmm. and I had no systems. Mm -hmm. And so our customers would come in. They would wait 50 minutes for a burger during their one-hour lunch. Yeah. They would come once and never come again. And because it was a tight-knit community, one person told the other. Yeah. Literally, on our grand opening, we had 1,500 people walk through the door. Wow. Walk out and never come back never in. Never come back in. Right? And so I had brought in this guy that was Steve's friend, Keith Carnavali. And he um, he was the first, first time I had heard the concept KISS, Keep It Simple keep it Stupid. Simple. And this is actually our second core value in our company now. Uh, this is why I wear all black. This is, I literally have three jeans that are exactly the same. This is the same shirt that I wear almost every day. I've got four of them. Mm -hmm. um, I've got three shoes that are always black. And, and, and this got, you know, it's the concept of kiss. Mm -hmm. um, but he had actually came in and said, hey, bro, you're a dumb kid that don't know what you're doing. I can give you two options. Here's $200,000, take them and run, mm -hmm. or I can help you turn this place around. And I said, I don't want your money. Help me turn this place around. And w my brother had um, had now decided to shut down the pizzeria, the family pizzeria. Okay. So what we did is we moved all of his equipment into our place because our restaurant was everything. It was Mediterranean, barbecue. I mean, we sold it all. It was everything. Okay. It was everything. Cool. And this okay. is where the whole kiss came around. But I knew that the pizzeria thing worked, and there wasn't there wasn't a local pizzeria. So I'm like, all right, local pizzeria, country bar, you know, family oriented. Let's make it happen. We had, for two years, we had been doing about twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000 a month. Two months prior, literally the first 30 days after we switched the concept, we did 47000 and we were projecting to do 65000 the following month. Okay. And this then before, before the fire. That was before the fire. So it wasn't just that the fire happened and it I did. had no insurance. It also happened and derailed you. It was also happened literally two months after I had turned the business around and for finally for two years after the grind, mm -hmm. I actually had figured it out. And I had a solid team. And we actually had started building culture. And I actually started liking what I'm doing. And I actually had things going for me. Mm -hmm. You know? And it was around the same time that I also stopped paying insurance because, like, well, it's been two months. Right. What's the worst can happen? I can take this money and invest here and here and here. Because, you know, restaurants are going to have $10 million uh, policy and all this stuff. I spend like almost two grand a month. Mm -hmm. And um, I had met someone. Now I had nothing. You know, my, my, my dad, this is literally the last money he has because my, my brother decided to shut down the pizzeria, not sell it, shut it down. Right, right. So that cash flow is done. So now my family had literally zero coming in and I needed to now support them mm -hmm. with a business that's losing four or $5,000 a month, mm -hmm. you know? And so I just, I remember sitting in the office and I'm sitting, we had a pretty long office, couches, desk, and I'm sitting, my dad is there like pissed off. Mm -hmm. My girlfriend is here. And then my father-in-law walks, my now father-in-law walks in. This is the first time I'm meeting him. And my dad is sitting oh, down. Wow. And so they meet, you know, uh -huh. they speak the same language, same culture. And my girlfriend introduced, because my girlfriend and my dad, they knew each other. Mm -hmm. She introduces him. And then I, I get introduced to my father-in-law. The worst first impression. <laughs> you did not want to meet your father-in-law two seconds after your restaurant burned down. Don't do that. Um, and he's looking at me like, okay, first you're dating my daughter. Now your restaurant burned down. You're a total fucking loser. Yeah. I don't know why I'm here. Exactly. But he was a handyman. Okay. And I told my girlfriend, hey, can your dad come? Because we need to clean this shit up. Yeah. 
So this was uh, four days before the the Pacquiao and 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 Mayweather fight, fight. Mm-hmm. and so I had spent like seven thousand dollars that I didn't have to to view like for the pay per view, mm-hmm. and I'm like, all right, guys, we got to make it happen because we got to open up. I've got four days, and the fire marshal's like, I don't know about you, but this place is gonna be here like this for at least six months, while we do what we do, and then the health instruct, uh, inspector out of nowhere shows up and he takes the. A out of the window and he puts this red thing. And so all these things are happening. I'm just sitting there and I'm, I can see my life falling right before my eyes. I'm just sitting there and I'm seeing all these things happening. And it's like, you know, when, when like, you know, in movies we see like life just kind of stopping and it's like on like slow motion. And I could just see like pieces just falling everywhere. And I'm just sitting there and I'm, I'm powerless. Mm -hmm. I've got no money. I've got no resource. No one wants to lend me money. I've, I've asked multiple banks to lend me money for the remodel. Everyone had said no, I've got zero credit because both the car that I, the cool Cadillac, mm-hmm. and I had bought my mom a Honda Pilot, both got repoed like a few months prior to that because I hadn't been paying. Oh, wow. And so this was like, literally it was the worst day of my life. Mm-hmm. And this was April 28th, 2015. But you survived it. I did. What happened next? Because you, you can't leave us hanging. I mean, that, like, you're oh, sitting coming there. Coming on the next episode. You, you, yeah, right. You, you're sitting there. You're, well, at the moment, you don't know it's, he's your father-in-law yeah. to be, but yeah. soon to be father-in-law. Yeah. That first impression, obviously, was not the best of first impressions, for sure. But you got to work, right? You, you rolled your sleeves back up and jumped You'd in? You'd think so. Okay. For the next two months, I go into depression. Okay. And I start drinking heavily, and I get a DUI. And I end up in jail. Okay. And uh, and this is where the mustache came in, actually, because I started growing a beard. I, I don't know if I have pictures online, but I had, for, for, for a while, I had this big old beard. Mm-hmm. I just didn't feel like, I was, just life was meh, you know? I was like, you know, all these dreams that I had, this was fantasy world. This was like, you know dreams and this is reality this is what life is like i need to leave that and live here because this is probably what i'm going to do for the rest of my life bitter just yeah i mean victim mentality like just i gave up i was pretty much i had pretty much given up and i went like that for two months and uh it was just like i didn't want to wake up i would i you know i had i had kind of stayed away from my friends for a while because i was so busy with the restaurant but now my family didn't even give a shit about me. My dad was absolutely pissed off with me. Mm-hmm. Everyone thought I was an absolute piece of shit. And it, it just, honestly, now looking back at it, I don't know how I wasn't suicidal because I wasn't. That was okay. the only one thing that I wasn't. Okay. And now looking back at it, I'm like, huh, interesting. If I was suicidal, I wouldn't have blamed myself. Right. But I wasn't. I'm not sure why. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. It just never crossed my mind. But you got to a point where you decided to shape the beard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did, I did. Um, but it, I think it was it was a day where I was every time we hung out, with my girlfriend and I, I had a, a pint of Hennessy, okay. and I just picked up a cup from Seven Eleven and I filled it up with ice, and I would just because now I couldn't drive anymore, and my license was suspended, so she would pick me up, and you know, luckily, man, she never God, gave me shit God, about it. God bless her for sticking yeah, with you. Man. <laughs> I know, right? Like you know, it's funny because sometimes I see uh, posts like you know us going out and stuff like that, and people you know comment. Bitch, gold digger. And I'm like, <laughs> no, uh, if you only knew. If you only knew. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I remember, you know, going out to like making up stories. Uh, there is the USS Midway uh, uh, thing. Um, it's this big uh, like uh, plane um, uh, carrier in San Diego. Now mm-hmm. it's a museum. I remember taking her to this place that was next to it. Mm-hmm. And I walked in. Tickets were like $150 a person. Mm-hmm. And I had like 45 bucks. And then I look around and I see the USS Midway. I'm like, you know. All of my life, I've been wanting to become a pilot. Mm. I need to go. I need you to take you there because t- I knew tickets were like ten bucks or something right, right, like right. that, you know. And so I've got so many stories like that. But yeah, she stuck around, man. Wow. And I remember one day she was like, she you know, loved you. She did. She definitely she loved did. you because the, love is the only thing that gets you through what you were going through. And she did. De- she definitely did. Yeah. She's okay. she's made so many sacrifices. I mean, even la- in later years. Um, and I remember one day she was like, you know. I understand, you know, you've almost given up. Now I was, um, so I had to pay my employees. Right. That was the only thing that okay. I cared about. Okay. My landlord sued me. I owed the IRS like 47K. I was about $150,000 in debt after mm-hmm. all that. Mm-hmm. And so, but one thing is I needed to pay my employees. Mm-hmm. They hadn't been paid. First, 
I needed to pay them for two reasons. Number one, because they hadn't been paid and they were working, you know, hand to mouth. Right. Second, they all lived in my town and they all threatened to kick my ass next time they saw me. Right. right. And so I didn't want to walk, you know, I didn't want to get stabbed or something. And yeah. I'm like, I need to pay these people. So what I did is I picked up two jobs. I started driving for Uber. Okay. While my license was suspended, and I can tell you how I made that work. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and um, and I started, excuse me, I started uh, uh, dishwashing at Hilton hotels. Okay. So um, she told me, and, and, you know, this like I, for a while it was like this is my life. You know, I'm just gonna go to work, pay these people, and then I just didn't have any plans anymore. Mm-hmm. And so I I realized that this is probably all I'm gonna do. And uh, I remember her just saying, "Hey, you know." Um, you've always dreamed big. And just because this thing didn't work doesn't mean you are a failure. Mm -hmm. Like the restaurant doesn't, you know, doesn't define you. Mm -hmm. That failed, but that doesn't define you. And I think that's what happens with a lot of people is that they are so attached to their relationships. They are Mm -hmm. so attached to their businesses. They're so attached to things around them that when they go sour, they think that they are Mm -hmm. bad and they are sour and they are things. Look, man, Donald Trump... Claimed bankruptcy three times. Mm-hmm. He's worth seven billion dollars and became the U.S. you know a U.S. president. Mm-hmm. So it's like there is never shame in resetting. Absolutely, we've all hit rock bottom. But it's about what are you going to do? Are you going to just stay there? Are you going to come back up? Mm-hmm. Right. And um, I was offered a sixty k a year job at Hilton Hotels to be a manager because one of the supervisors recognized me from the restaurant. He was one of the food purveyors that used to deliver food to us. Okay. And uh, plus benefits, and I was like, shit, 60K a year. Good deal to me. Right. But then I started doing the math. I'm like, okay, but that will take me like almost 20 years to clear my debt. And I'd be 45 at the time. And then now and I was like, oh, there's got to be a better way. Okay. I met a friend um, uh, that we hadn't seen each other in many years. Uh, we were high school friends. And he said, he told me about this thing. He said, I, I work from home. Hmm. And I was like, what the fuck does that mean? It's like, I work from home. I was like, all right, what does that even mean? Right. Because for me, it's like I was always in the restaurant business, mm-hmm. man. I went to work, people came in, paid them all this stuff. But I, you know, this is what I thought life was about. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like I work from home. So I remember one day taking my Toshi, my three inch, 20 pound Toshiba laptop oh, to Starbucks. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, you know, I opened it, said, there's this thing called YouTube. I had literally never done anything online. Okay. The only time I Ever. used it, nothing. Okay. I had, I had a Facebook page that I posted like once every six months. Okay. And I had, uh, uh, um, I would like use Google Maps. Okay. But that's it. Uh-huh. I went on YouTube, I think probably for the first time in my life. Mm-hmm. And I literally opened YouTube and I was like, you know, I'm talking to my laptop. And I'm like, you're supposed to make me money. Show me how. Mm-hmm. And I just opened YouTube and I'm like, how to make money online. And I just, it was like this world. Opened the, up. These, like this, this flood, you know, gates of, of flooding just opened and all this stuff coming to me. And I'm seeing all these like 15, 16, 17 year olds driving around in Lamborghinis. And I'm like, and that honestly for a second made me feel even worse about worse, myself. Right. Cause I'm like, I'm a 25 year old kid that's been running a, a multi hundred thousand uh, dollar uh, uh, company, mm-hmm. you know, 30 employees under my command. And I look where I am mm-hmm. yet. These kids like what? Exactly. It's gotta be, like, this is not right. You know, like, and this is when I became even more bitter and more sour. Because I was like, there's something wrong here. Mm -hmm. And I see that happening today all the time. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you'll have uh, someone that's older, maybe gone to college, has all these careers and everything in their lives, and then they think they're accomplished. And then now with today's era, they'll look around and be like, oh, is this 19-year-old making $5 million a year right now? And I can't even make 100 grand. Like, what's going on? There's there's something absolutely wrong about this picture, you know? But it's not you, man. It's the society that you came up in. Mm -hmm. It's what's been planted in your mind. And this is why- It's the programming. Absolutely. And this is why right now at BJK University, I'm not sure if you're a college uh, graduate or not, but um, we always say fuck college Mm -hmm. because I I didn't do it through through school. And I think that school is is meant to create a whole bunch of employees. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, our, our mission is to impact a million lives by- helping them accelerate the learning curve and not needing to waste tens of thousands and, and years of their lives learning literally shit they'll never use, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I think that as a society, our whole education platform is completely broken. Yeah. I mean, I, I am a university grad, uh, double major, history and psychology, minor in political science, and a certificate in government service and administration. Oh, 
Then I went on to law school. Like I, I had, I definitely, I, I drank the Kool Aid. Yeah. Um, but I, I sit on the board of trustees for a university right now, and I'm constantly in there saying, "Hey, listen, you guys need to fix it because what's going on in society today, it's what what has been taught for the past five to eight decades is yeah. not what is needed today." Yep. And I, I I've given presentations, and I, I use the phrase. Don't waste your time going to university. Mm. And when I when I mean by that, it's a multifaceted discussion. It's like wasting time is the issue. Yeah. Like if you're going to go to university, don't waste that time. Right. Use it productively. Because university can be a great place to network. It can sure. be a great place to just learn social skills. It's an expensive way to learn. Yeah, them, I know, right? But it could be. Yeah. So you but you have to be financially literate before you make the decision to right. go to university. You don't select a degree that, that has no possibility of you being able to earn enough to pay, pay back any debt that you may accumulate getting that degree. Yeah. So I 100,000% agree with what you're saying. Yeah. When, when you look at, at your experience then, your, your, your girlfriend at the time is still with you. She's putting up with everything that's happening, and she's saying, okay, you used to dream big. You found out about, about YouTube. You opened up your laptop. Yeah. You're seeing all this stuff, but you're now getting a little bit bitter. But something changed. Something transitioned. Yeah. What was the transition? Yeah. So I, I kept. I mean, I, I just went at it, you know. And I was like, I'm gonna figure something out, you know, okay. because I I saw. So I saw what this could do, mm -hmm. and I saw like I almost also became bitter towards retail. Okay. You know, and I was like, I want I want nothing to do with people anymore. Okay. I just want to sit in my house, open my computer, and do something. And it seems like I could do that. Okay. I'm fine with that because. The other thing is the environment that my restaurant created was just not very good. Mm -hmm. I hated working there. My employees hated working there. Um, my customers hated coming there. Mm -hmm. It was a very toxic environment because the business wasn't making money. The, the bartenders weren't making money. And I was always pissed off. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I love my dad, but I, what I got from him was a big ego. Yeah. Like, 10 times bigger than this room. Mm -hmm. And also this mentality of you and your employees have a fine, there's a fine line between you and your employees. Mm. The minute they cross over, you can never tell them what to do. So you can't have beers with your with your employees. You can't go out and call them buddies. And he would literally sit and watch. And if I like have a conversation for too long with someone, he'll, he'll tell me to stop talking and let him go back to work. Mm. And what that did is, like, deep down, I had a battle always. Yeah. I'm like, dude, I'm a 23-year-old kid, and a lot of these guys are my age. It's like, I want to buddy up with them. Like, they're cool. Like, right. I know they're cool people. I want to hang out with them. Mm -hmm. But then it was my dad in the background. And because I was that way, it wasn't coming natural to them. And they resented me. Mm -hmm. The day my restaurant burnt down, I got a text message from Corey. Um, I had just fired him about two months prior because he had a big ego. I had a big ego, and we had a tiny kitchen. And it just couldn't <laughs> fit, fit both of our egos, you know? And um, great guy. Um, he's like, I bet that pizza is pretty well done now. Ha, 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 asshole. <laughs> the day my restaurant burns down, right? And so I was like, they didn't like me when I, when I had the restaurant. As I was going down, they were kicking me. Kicking you on the way down. Something is going on. Yeah. It's not them, it's me. Yeah. You know? And so this is where that shifted for me. Okay. So I realized that, okay, it's not that the world is, is, is fucked up. I'm fucked up. I need right, to right. change something, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized, all right, I need to, to do something about this. So I was like, all right, let, let me open my mind a little bit. Let me mm -hmm. stay open-minded and kind of allow, allow this thing to, to actually happen, you know? Okay. And so I started trying. And okay. so I got into, I mean, anything and everything, crypto, uh, oh, affiliate okay. marketing. I mean, anything you see online today, right? Mm -hmm. Penny stock trading, this thing, that thing. Amazon just stuck to me, man. Okay. Something about it, I like the concept. Mm -hmm. So I started with, with this thing called arbitrage. Okay. Where you go to stores, you buy a product, mm -hmm. and then you resell it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And so it was, uh, I think it was December, around Christmas of 2015. Okay. My girlfriend would take her mom's SUV. Mm -hmm. and we would drive around to Home Goods all around San Diego. Mm -hmm. And I would, um, there was this toy. It came in two colors. It came in pink and purple. And the pink one sold like three times more than the purple. And I was making like $15, $16 profit a unit. Wow. I remember the first day I woke up and I opened my Amazon app and it literally says I, I had made one sale overnight. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I had made $42.99 in my sleep 
blew, blew my mind. mind. Yeah. Because until then, I had to shop the food, store it, mm -hmm. clean it, cook it, serve it, clean after the customer to make $10 on a sandwich and a beer. Yeah. And here I was making 15, 20 bucks in profit, pure profit while into my slept. bank while my sleep. And although it was only 20 bucks, still, but I was like, holy shit. Yeah. See, now I'm talking about, I'm like getting goosebumps. And I was like, you know what? This is scalable. Mm -hmm. I could do it in my sleep. What if I sold five units in my sleep? Yeah. What if I sold 10 units in my sleep? Mm -hmm. And so what I would do is I would go around San Diego. I would tell my, my now sister-in-law in Vegas, go to the stores, buy all the, you know. But then I realized, okay, this is not scalable. Yeah. I'm driving around all day. Mm -hmm. There's only a limited amount of units. I try to go to Alibaba and like manufacture the product, but they're like, dude, you can't, this yeah. is a, a you know, trademark, trademark product. You mm -hmm. can't go against it. Like you're, you'll get sued. And this is when I discovered the other concept, which is what we do and teach now, which is called private label. And that's pretty much, I go to the manufacturer that produces this water bottle. Mm -hmm. I tell them that I need a thousand of them or 500 or whatever. I slap my own logo. I create some type of a differentiation and I sell it on Amazon under my own personal listing, right? And I, you work on growing that. Okay. And that's when I saw, okay, this is scalable. And I was like, all right, let me try that. But that needs a little investment. Yeah. The arbitrage doesn't, this yeah. does. Ar well, arbitrage needs the investment of time. So you're yes. investing your time right. and, your, and I had all sweat, I had that all day. Sweat equity. Yeah. You had plenty of that. Definitely. But, but on on this side, private yeah. labeling, you, you have money. to come up with cash. You need to come up with cash. And so I realized that okay, I need money. I've mm -hmm. got nothing. Okay. So I was able to convince a couple of friends to lend me money. And the first five thousand dollars I borrowed from my now mother in law. Okay. So I had been dating her daughter about eight months. Middle Eastern, mm -hmm. you don't just date my daughter. I didn't just date her daughter, but I borrowed five thousand dollars from exactly. her. Exactly. Right. So, um, you know, again, pulling. Yes. Because it was so massive in the future, mm -hmm. I was willing to do anything. Anything you took. I, I didn't like. I see a lot of people say, "I'm broke. I'm going to school. I'm. I've got two thousand dollars. I've got five hundred dollars." Like broke is a mindset. Though. Dude, figure out your why first. Exactly. Because if you had a strong why, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Mm -hmm. And like, if I was able to do it with one hundred and fifty k in debt. You could do it with $2,000 in your bank. Oh, yeah. You're $152,000 better than me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, um, bought it, launched my first three products. I had about $7,000 now borrowed. Mm -hmm. um, I launched three products and all of them flopped. Okay. And so I was like, all right, something is wrong here. Mm -hmm. I see it working. Why did it not work for me? And that's when I, I, I realized that I need to really put my, because I saw this similarity. Okay. I saw that YouTube is John Taffer uh, and I was watching YouTube videos and I failed just like I was watching John Taffer and I failed. Right, right, right. And I was like, maybe I need to go for the paid stuff. Okay. And I found a kid, 18 year old kid in a tank top driving a Lamborghini. Mm -hmm. And I was like, fuck, I gotta do this, man. So I put my ego aside for the first time in my life. And I called my girlfriend, yeah. her again. And I said, what's your car number? He said, why? I was like, do you trust me? She said, yes, but why? I was like, just give me your car number. I'm sitting at Starbucks, Lakeside, California, same town where my restaurant was, mm -hmm. and um, swiped the card, 497. The shittiest course I've bought in my life. But it taught me three things mm -hmm. that my fourth product succeeded. Okay. And I literally, I watched the entire course while I was sitting at Starbucks. It was like seven Hard hours, course. eight hours. But I just like something from. very like small things. And I was like, holy shit, I wish I had invested the 500 a month ago. Those products would have succeeded. Wow. And this is where I see a lot of people do the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. It's that they, you know, well, instead of investing in mentorship, I'll invest in here. Instead of doing this, I'll do that. It's like, dude, why reinvent the wheel? Mm -hmm. Someone else had eaten shit before you, mm -hmm. gone through the trial and error, just tap into their, like people ask all the time, Shortcut to success. What's the shortcut to success? I'm like, number one doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But if it ever existed, is tapping into someone else's success. Exactly. That's literally the only shortcut that I know of. There might be one, I just don't know about it yet. Now, modeling behavior is definitely the best way to go. Yeah. I, there's so much similarity between your transition period and my transition period. Because I, I was in a similar, not, not I didn't have a, a restaurant burned down around me, but my very first practice was complete mess yeah. like I, I didn't have resources I had to learn by trial and error and it was pretty much all error everything I was doing was was wrong I got to a point where I had hit rock bottom I was I was a few hundred thousand dollars in debt at the time yeah and I somehow mustered up the courage to leave my ego at the door and yeah. reached out to mentors and 
and and got the knowledge I needed to put my life on track. So yeah. you did the same thing. You got the knowledge you needed to start putting your life on track. How quickly did you get traction? Uh, immediately. Okay. Because I had done a lot of research prior. Okay. And I, I literally only needed two, three things. You know, like simplest thing. First product I launched, it flopped because it was seasonal. When okay. I looked at the numbers, the numbers were good. But by the time I hit Amazon, numbers were bad and I made no money. Mm -hmm. So I literally saw this. One of the videos said seasonality. I'm like, what is that? Don't launch a seasonal product. Oh, shit. Okay. Well, that fixes that product. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it was just simple little things yeah. that I just got. And I'm, and I'm talking about in, a, in an afternoon. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about I studied up, you know, right. for five years. Yeah. Afternoon, spent a few hundred dollars, borrowed, mm -hmm. you know, so now I'm like a hundred and almost 60K in debt, yeah. you know, and, um, th you know, second product after that successful, third product after that successful, yeah. and it just started hitting. Snowballing. Yeah. Yeah. I think Tony Robbins says distilling decades into days. Yeah. That's the nature of mentorship. Yep. You could tap into a program and learn something in an afternoon that'll change your life. That's right. And that's exactly what did. That's what pretty happened. much what. And since then, I've just been obsessed. This year, so far, we've invested over five hundred seventy thousand in consulting, coaches, masterminds for me, the co you know, the team, yeah. and, and everyone else. And I've just been obsessed. I'm like obsessed in self development now. I just started uh, learning speed reading. Oh, okay. And I, I was always a slow speed reader, mm -hmm. uh, a low slow, uh, slow reader. Mm -hmm. um, I used to listen because I'm like, I can't. Like, it'll take me forever to read a book. And then I started reading and I would, it took me like six weeks to finish a book. And I'm like, there's gotta be, I mean, you know, talking about it, the average CEO reads 60 books a year. And I'm like, how? I could barely <laughs> read, you know, eight, yeah. you know? And so I, I heard, um, I was in one of Tony's events and he said that he had read 700 books in seven years and my jaw dropped. dropped. I was right. like, holy shit, I need to do that. Yeah. And my how? life has <laughs> never been the same, man. Okay. I just picked it up two months, a uh, month and a half ago. First month, I read five books. Wow. Retaining almost everything. Okay. And I was like, holy shit, this is cool. Teach me more. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're definitely going to have to give us the information on yeah. the, how you learn the yeah, speed yeah. reading thing. We'll drop it in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. When, when you look at, at the past, so I'm going to fast forward us a little bit. Yeah. We're now into to the pandemic. Sure. Okay. How did, how did that impact your business? So it impacted my business positively, my mindset negatively. Okay. And uh, I've got a friend, a sweetheart of a person. He's got a coaching business. He does very well. But every time I talk to him about scaling, mm -hmm. he sells to the Turkish market. Okay. And he's always telling me how the U.S. dollar is so much more there. Mm -hmm. How the economy there is this. How they don't have money. How this and how that. And I'm like, dude, do you realize it's all here? Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with your market. Correct. It's absolutely all here. And so just right before I get into the pandemic, I just want to give kind of a, a bit of a transition from where I was to where I got in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It was late 2018, okay. and I was hanging out with my uh, 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 now wife's cousin. Okay. Um, and he, and this is a question that he asked me once, and now almost every conversation that I start or that I have, mm -hmm. I ask that question to to the other person. Okay. He said, where do you see yourself in the next three to five years? Okay. And at the time, now I've been an Amazon seller for about two and a half years. And a half. Okay. Yeah. And uh, at, I, was, uh, I was approaching seven figures a year. Okay. You know, um, I had a business making ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a month in profits. Mm -hmm. I'm working probably 30 minutes a day. I've got two VAs that are taking care of everything. Mm -hmm. Business is scaling. Perfect. Uh, debt is cleared. On my way to retire my parents, my dad now, you know, Respect is back. We're all on good terms. Life is good. Okay. Um, and I stared at him, and I for ten minutes, I just couldn't answer him. And he's like, "Not a like a more successful Amazon seller." I'm like, I don't know. He's like, "Well, that's odd because if I had asked you that two years ago, that's probably what you would have said." I'm like, "Yeah, that's true, but I don't know, man." You don't know. And I went home and I started thinking about it. And what happened was, for about four or five months, you know, waking up at eight became nine. Nine became 10, 10 mm -hmm. became 11. The thing that was in the future that was pulling me, I had arrived. was present. I had arrived. Mm -hmm. And I had not re-anchored myself. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I started resting on my laurels. And when I looked back, I had done that again in the past and I had blew through the business. And so I realized that I needed something that's gonna be pulling me again. Mm -hmm. um, 
for a couple of months because I had gone away for such a long time, just literally buried to like work and, and make it happen. When I came back out, people were like, where have you been? I'm like, this. I'm like, oh, what's that? We've been hearing about this around, like teach me. So I had been teaching a couple of people. Okay. And I remember Zach Brown sent me a text message saying, uh, it was just a random day. Bashar, you're the fucking man over the last six months, I've made $36,000 in profits. The profits are cool. It's a cool part. But what's more cool about it is that Zach Brown was a 23-year-old kid from North Carolina okay. who all he wanted to do is just take his dirt bike around America and join tournaments and just do that. That was his passion. Okay. And Zach Brown couldn't do that because Zach Brown had his job. He was broke. He, he pretty much, um, you know, he would... Uh, uh, um, borrow money to join tournaments or do odd jobs to join tournaments and stuff like that. But now Zach had a business that was being operated from anywhere in the world and he could enjoy his passion. And when I heard that, I was like, I've got something that, yes, over the last couple of years has impacted my life, mm -hmm. but I could actually do that for other people. Right. And that's awesome. That is awesome. You know? 100% agree. That's awesome. And 2019, BJK University was born. Okay. Um, so 2020, fast forward, I was one man show running BJK University, trying to scale it. Mm -hmm. I'm looking around, you know, everyone is running around launching courses and stuff like that. I'm taking some courses to learn more just to see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Cause I was selling my course for 399 and no one was buying. Oh. And I'm like, dude, I'm watching these courses and it's like, dude, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. I'm here a multi seven figure seller. It's like, what's happening right now? Like something is wrong, mm -hmm. but I didn't know sales. I didn't know marketing. Mm -hmm. I was just a good Amazon seller. That's it. Yeah. And so what my goal was, I'm going I'm to sell the cheapest course, best value, but that doesn't always work. Correct. Um, you know, people, people value the thing because I, I had like maybe 50 students and no one was getting results. And I'm like jumping on one-on-one -on -one calls with them. I'm doing all the stuff. I'm like, dude, like I just need to come to your house and do the work for you. Like, I don't understand what else you want me to do. Right. You know? Um, 2020 came around and uh, it was me and one other person mm -hmm. who's now our head of sales. He was my first hire ever. Aaron, appreciate you, Aaron, if you're watching this. Um, and pandemic, man, it hit hard. I was in denial mm -hmm. that America is going to shut down. Because to me, it was like, dude, the world can shut down. America will never shut down. Like, that's just not a thing. You know, it just, it's not a thing. Yeah. It just, it's not reality. I was, I, now we moved to downtown San Diego out first time in my life, living in a high rise, living a good life, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, uh, downtown San Diego, the, the, the gas lamp district was uh, probably about, I don't know, a few blocks away. So my wife and I remember walking and seeing like trash bags, like flying in the air. I'm like, holy shit, it's real. Mm -hmm. People in masks. Desolation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm walking down the, the sidewalk. People coming down the other part that like go around me. I'm like, the fuck are you doing right now? Right, right. You know, like, this is weird. And that's when I realized that, holy shit, this is real. Mm -hmm. And so deep down, it's like, yeah, people got no money. People, world is shut down. I stopped scaling my Amazon business. Um, I actually started liquidating it because I was, because what I wanted to do is focus on coaching. That's where right. I found fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't want to be an Amazon seller anymore. So I sold, I had two, two accounts. I sold one of them. I was in the process of selling the other one. And, um, and then I, you know, my coaching business was just not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then I just was like, dude, what business? People can't even buy groceries. They're not thinking about launching a business now. And it was all in my head. It was 100% in your head. It was all in my head. And I remember one morning waking up, shivering. Mm -hmm. I thought I had a fever. I thought I had a fever every day. Mm -hmm. I thought I had a cough every day. Mm -hmm. I, had a, I thought I had a, a sore throat every day because that's what every you get day. when you have COVID. Exactly. And so um, I'm shivering. And then I don't know what, it, I don't know what the hell happened. My wife comes out of the room and she's like, stop being a little bitch. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and I'm like wearing like a, a, a robe and I'm like shivering. And then once she said that, I looked at her, I'm like, go fuck you. Like, I'm just yelling at her and stuff like that. And then because I snapped out of it, I stopped shivering. Right. And I got up and there was nothing wrong with me. Right. Mm. And I was like. It's amazing what the what mind the can do, What the fuck just right? happened right now? It's amazing what the mind can do. I used to get sick twice per year. Uh -huh. I decided that I will never get sick again. Wonderful. Until April of this year, I got COVID, mm -hmm. but I had not been sick ever since. No, flu, nothing. Okay. Nothing. And I realized that it was all here. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. That year, 
we exploded our business. Mm. We went from two people. December of that year, we were four people. December of 21, we were 57 people. Wow. Wow. That, that's a... Wait a minute. So I have to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm keeping track of this. You, you've gone through some major challenging periods of your life. You're now, now on the edge of December 2021. A huge business. Individuals behind you bringing change in the world. Yes. How are you feeling at this point? Incredible. Because you're actually changing people's lives. Yeah, and, and, and this, is, this is the thing where it turned from just a business and a lifestyle to we're on a mission. Okay. We're not just here to make money. We're here to serve. Tell me more about your mission. So I was approached by uh, uh, one of our pod leaders who's unfortunately not with us anymore. And he said, I love what you're about, man, but we're growing and we get it because we work with you directly. But it's like, as the company grows, everyone needs to roll in the same direction. And he handed me Start With Why by mm -hmm. Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek. Mm -hmm. And I read that book and my life changed. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I realized that he's right. We don't have core values. We don't have a mission that we're on. And I realized that people will do everything for someone else mm -hmm. a lot more than and before they would do it for themselves. Yes. Because this is how I am. Mm -hmm. I will do anything and everything for you, but then I will probably delay things for myself, mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I, um, when I read that book, I realized that, you know what? We need to stand for something more than what we're about. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, so our, our, we're, we're on a mission impact, 1 million lives at a time. And the way we want to do it is by providing people the skill and, and, and allowing them to control their, their destiny and through those skills, without needing to go to schools and, and, and spend tens of thousands or waste tens of thousands waste. of dollars uh, and things they'll never and use. And time. And right. time. Right, absolutely. Because that's, that's even more valuable. Absolutely. And so this is our mission, you know. And uh, um, now we started BJK Foundation, which is, uh, um, which is on a mission to make the world a better place, one million lives at a time, by uh, uh, feeding, housing, and educating uh, the underprivileged. So it's our, our nonprofit where we donate a, a chunk of our uh, profits into the foundation and then just, you know, uh, uh, invest it in, in other uh, causes that we are, uh, that we support, okay. you know? And so I just realized that I'm here to serve. Mm -hmm. I, I've come to the conclusion that my life is about service. My life is not about making money and building wealth. But through service, Built wealth and, and making money comes as a byproduct. Mm -hmm. And the less you focus on making money and the more you focus about serving other people, mm -hmm. um, number one, the more fulfilled you live. And number two, um, there's only one world and there's only one life. Mm -hmm. And if we're not all collectively doing something about it to make it a better place, uh, especially if you have been fortunate, especially if you have been able to figure something out. Right, because right. unfortunately, not everybody... Uh, has been able to accomplish what we've been able to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And it's about the level of awareness, right? And so for us, it's about creating that, that awareness of the missed opportunities. It's like, look, you've got this life, I get it. There's this other thing, and yes, you can do it, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to do it, no problem, I can help you. If not, totally cool. I just want to make sure that you know that you are capable of doing this thing. Mm -hmm. And I understand you're here, and it's not your fault, it's just the conditioning that's been, you've been brainwashed for decades mm -hmm. that this you is and all. your parents and right. your grandparents Absolutely. have all been brainwashed. Absolutely, that this is all what you, you know, get a degree, get a good job, get a nice car, get a mortgage, and that's it, and then retire at 65. Well, it's like, what the fuck do you do at 65 again? Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. sit on the porch and read a newspaper and what? Yeah, there's only so much uh, sweet tea you could drink, right? You know what I'm saying? When, when you look at, at the next leg then, because obviously you, you've been asked this question a lot and you ask this question a lot of others. Yeah. What, it, what does the next three to five years look like for you then? Um, so for us is currently we're focused on the Amazon space. Okay. Um, because I was a professional Amazon seller and I still am. I, I realized that I can't coach people if I'm not doing the thing. So I got yeah. in, back into selling. Mm -hmm. But now I'm more of an investor into other businesses rather than being in the, in the okay. trenches. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
business-wise is scaling into other horizontals. Okay. First, we want to scale vertically within Amazon. So it's, uh, you know, uh, because right now we only have one core offer. We want to do a mastermind. We want to launch software and stuff like that. But then it's really going horizontally into other parts of providing people other skills. Okay. Just like a university. That's why I, we called it a university. Okay. You don't just go to learn one thing. Mm -hmm. There are different things. Some people might not want to do e-commerce. Some people might want to not want to do this. So we've got plans to get into sales. Uh, we've got a 43% sales team. Mm -hmm. So getting to sales, getting into uh, 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 investing, real estate investing, things like that. And the way we would do it is obviously sales and marketing, we have that skill so we can teach it. Mm -hmm. But other skills like real estate investing or stock trading or crypto or whatever, mm -hmm. um, we would find a micro influencer, someone in the space, we would bring them under the umbrella of BJK University mm -hmm. and then pretty much allow them to, to provide the transformation, you know? Mm -hmm. But all under the one mission of impacting people's lives and tailoring to the consumer, not the business. Right. You know, right. this is this is our this is our avatar. And that's the person that I am most con that I most connect with. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that there is they're the hardest to work with. Yes. You know, and my students, I love you all, but you're the hardest <laughs> to work with. Um, in fact, two year a uh, year and a half ago, um, we were looking at how, how what can we do to to get our students better results, faster results. And it was improving this, improving that. But then I realized, hang on a second. We're only focusing on skill. Like Tony Robbins talks about, he's like, the only thing holding you from your potential mm -hmm. is your own self. And mm -hmm. your own self depends on two things. Number one, your skill level. Number two, your mindset. And it's 80% mindset, 20% yeah. skill level. And we were just focused on the 20%. So we brought on a mindset trainer that three times a year does an eight-week class. She's actually about to come back and do another eight-week class for the rest of the year that works with our students on their mindset, mm. their mindset with money, their mindset, their relationships, all that. So what we want to do is kind of the front end of BJK University will be focused on money mm -hmm. because I feel like you know, people talk about passion all the time, mm -hmm. but I feel like unless you're a, a, an artist, you know, you picked up a soccer ball at two years old and mm -hmm. you're just good at it. Right. For me, at least this is what it was for me. I found my passion after I had figured out my finances. Mm -hmm. And if you're broke, like when I was 150K in debt, I wasn't thinking about my passion. I was thinking about, I need to pay off my debt. I need to get married. I need to gain my dad's respect back. I need mm -hmm. to do all these things. And to do all these things, I need money in the bank. So I want to solve people's money problem first. Yeah, the most but, important freedom to fight for is financial freedom. Absolutely. It leads to all those freedoms. Absolutely. But I think what happens is, it's easy, once we get that figured out, it's easier to keep going in that mm -hmm. than looking at other parts of your life. Mm -hmm. And for me, success is you need to be a, a full, a full, a fully grounded person. Mm -hmm. And for me today, my five um, pillars of success are spirituality. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe in God. It could be whatever for anyone else, a higher power, whatever, whatever it, is, it is, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But spirituality, relationships, gratitude and contribution, mm -hmm. health, and then wealth. Wealth always seems to have last last seat. I don't know why every time I say this. I change the first four, but the wealth always comes last. I don't know why. But once you have those, you are a well-rounded human because you don't want to have a million dollars in the bank and a terrible uh, uh, relationship with your wife or with your kids or uh, $10 million in the bank and literally no friends because actually this happened to me three months ago. Mm. I was walking down Publix. I felt dizzy. I fell and had a seizure for the first time in my life. Oh my Goodness. And I woke up in the hospital, mm -hmm. an MRI a week and a half later, they said that they found a scratch in my brain. Okay. And to me, I was like, yep, I always knew that I was going to die young. This is it. I'm six months. And I felt this loneliness that I didn't have friends that I can just text and be like, hey, bro, this is what happened. Holy shit, I'll be right there. Right, right. I didn't have that. Oh, wow. And that's when I realized that the last 12 years of my life, I've just been focused on my financial success, mm -hmm. and I've ignored everything else. Yeah, I mean, money, money it definitely is not the most important thing in the world, but mm -hmm. it truly does impact everything that is. Yes. So it gives you the ability to have the freedom to, to enjoy building friendships and, and having good health care and, and being able to do all those other things. But you found that you're, you're going to transition your life over the course of the next three to five 
to incorporate more for you and building relationships for you? Oh, absolutely. The first thing I did is I uh, integrated a, because everyone that I had in my life as friends where I used to call them entrepreneurial friends. Mm. I'm like, fuck that. We're going to start having a monthly thing at my house. Mm -hmm. You're going to come to my house. I need to dig into you, who you are, bring your wife. Let's get to know each other. I love that. And our relationships have just gone to a completely different level. It's a totally different level when you do that. Uh, I've been scheduling fun activities with my wife. Literally, I block, you know. Yeah. Uh, Thursdays, I take that and I call it a, a health and wellness day. And I do acupuncture, oxygen therapy. Uh, I go see, I, 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 the, like when people say, well, we need doctors. I'm like, ah, I don't know. The, the, the traditional, you know, medical system has failed me. Mm-hmm. Um, now I see holistic doctors. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. I, I see two doctors. One is, uh, 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 She's, she's graduated, uh, uh, she has a degree in oriental medicine, like Chinese medicine. Mm-hmm. She does acupuncture, does all this energy stuff that three months ago I looked at her and said, lady, you look crazy. Right. Uh, but I do that one day, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, and this is what I want to do. That's why I want to first fix people's finances. So that they have the freedom to fix so they could, others. So they other do other things. Because right. if this happened to me five years ago, you would I don't know yeah. what I would have done, yeah. you know. But because I have the financial resources, now I could do that. So once I fix people's financial resources, I want to do, you know, other programs, whether if they're, you know, two day uh, workshops or seminars or whatever, mm-hmm. where we're, we're, we're going deep dive into relationships, into things that fulfill your life, into your health, into building your wealth, you know, passing it on, you know. Mm-hmm. But again, I'm on a mission to impact 1 million lives at a time. That doesn't stop at a million. Mm-hmm. I always say to my team, there are 7.5 billion people yeah. on planet Earth. I will try everything I can until I draw my last breath to touch every single one of them mm-hmm. in a way or another. I don't know what that looks like. And I'm not even worried about my bank account because I know th- as I deliver to them, my bank account is going to grow. So I'm not even looking at it. Absolutely. Yeah. Such an inspiring mission. I, when, I, when I bring guests on, on this podcast, I, I, like to, I like to entertain a, a thought exercise. So if you wouldn't mind indulging sure. me for a moment. Let's do it. I'd like you to imagine for a moment that you're able to go back in time mm. and sit down with a younger version of Bashar. You get to pick what age that is, what's going on in your life at the moment, and you get to share one thing with that younger version of yourself. Who do you go back to meet with, and what do you share? Um, probably leaving Iraq at 13. Okay. And I would say hang tight. It's going to be fun. <laughs> You're going to have an incredible life and just do you. I would not change one little thing. I would, I would almost be afraid to give advice mm-hmm. because if I, I would be almost afraid to live my life differently. Mm. Four or five years ago, I would say, man, why did the restaurant burn down? Mm-hmm. Today, I'm like, fuck thank, yeah. Thank God she yeah. did. Um, a month and a half, two months ago, I... When after my seizure, I went into, for about two months, I went into anxiety, panic attacks, almost borderline depression, mm-hmm. uh, because my, the only thoughts that were happening in my head was like, I'm 150 you know, pounds, I thought I, we have a chef that comes home and cooks for us, I work out five days a week, I thought I was living a healthy lifestyle, mm-hmm. and this happens, this can happen at any time, what kind of a life you know, am I going to have, I'm not going to be able to run my, my company, I'm not going to be able to run, to raise my kids, all this stuff. So all these things were happening. Yeah, yeah. I was literally paralyzed. The second I would leave the, our, our, our door, I would start shivering. Mm-hmm. I couldn't even go to restaurants. I couldn't do anything. Okay. Today, when I look back, I say, thank you. Mm-hmm. Because that opened, because now I look at life in an absolute different lens than I did three year, three months ago. Mm-hmm. And had that not happened, I don't know if I would have ever been this this person that I am today. Let's carry forward this thought exercise then. Let's say, imagine for a moment mm. that a future version of Bashar is able to come back in time and sit next to you on the couch. What does he share with you? Probably the same thing. Okay. I hope the same thing. I'm counting on it to be the same thing. I'm counting on it to be nothing but just keep doing what you're doing, bro. Everything that you've been through, today I have, I'm, I've trusted myself mm-hmm. that regardless what's going on, I trust that I have the resilience and that I have the confidence and the trust that I will come out the other side because I've been through so much shit and this is the first time that I have a health crisis Mm -hmm. and that's why I hit different. I've launched nine businesses, seven of which failed. 
I've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in the process. But this was the first time that I react this way and trying to overanalyze and everything. But, you know, looking back, now every time a crisis presents itself, mm -hmm. I get excited mm -hmm. because I know that when I'm off of it on the other side, that life is going to be a lot better than what it is today. I, I have a, on my whiteboard, I have a quote that I live by every month. Mm -hmm. And last month it was, thank you life for being difficult because it is through the difficulties and challenges that we learn and grow. Mm -hmm. So I hope that my future self would just say, keep fucking going, man. I love it. Great nuggets of wisdom. That So, so you now, Bashar, have shared two nuggets of wisdom with yourself. Yeah. Can you share a nugget of wisdom with our audience? Like one thing, if you were to leave them with something that whether it's inspiring or motivating or just transformational, what would you share with them if you can only share one thing? I would say find your why. Be clear on that why because it's got to be something that's pulling you and it can't be pushing all the time because pushing gets difficult, but pulling is a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, if you become very clear on that why, we all go through troubles. You've gone through troubles. I've gone through troubles. Everyone's gone through troubles. Absolutely. And But it's like, what? Well, how do you come out the other side better than where you started, right? Mm -hmm. It's the thing in the future that's pulling you towards it. Have an anchor in the future mm -hmm. and have it bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. Like if I, again, I don't want to change anything, but if I were to change one thing, my why would have been way bigger than clearing the debt because at the time it seemed like the 150K was yeah. going to be impossible. It's going to oh. take me like 20 years, yeah. you know? I didn't know that I would do it in like 24 months, you know? Right. And so I would make it something about so big, bigger than life, mm -hmm. bigger than you, bigger than your company, bigger than your team, bigger than your spouse, bigger than your children, bigger than anything and everything. Mm. And that when you think about it, the first like 10 times you think about it, you're like, Yep, I'm borderline crazy. That's it. You know, <laughs> like I've made that. I, I'm crazy, you know. Okay. But then little by little, you start realizing that, holy shit, this is so, like. This can happen. If I come anywhere close to this, do you know the impact? Mm. Do you know the magnitude? Do you know what I would be able to accomplish for myself, for my family, for people around me, for people that care for me, for people that want to see me succeed, for other people. Because Tony Robbins talks about this, this, this science of achievement and art of fulfillment, and he says a lot of people, he, he has billionaire uh, clients that call him billion dollars in the bank, absolutely mm -hmm. just depressed. It's like, how could you be depressed with a billion dollars in the bank? It's like, because they've been able to accomplish the art, the, the, the science of achievement, but it not accomplish the art of fulfillment. Right. And once you are fulfilled, once you find something that drives you, that's so big, and it's going to be just massive, man, mm -hmm. just massive. You know, people talk shit about uh, 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 Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. He's cashing out, I think a billion dollars, he said, of his Microsoft stock every single year to invest in his foundation. Mm -hmm. So he could do all these things that he's doing. Elon Musk, he knows that he's probably not going to accomplish his goals in his lifetime, right. but he's still going still at going it every it. day like he's going to get there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's so massive. It's so huge. It's bigger than life. If he can accomplish it, he will change civilizations for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's like, yep, we're going to do that. That's what we're going to do. I don't care if I work 23 and a half hours and only sleep 30 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. I'll still do it because it's so future you know, oriented in this anchor in the future that's pulling him every single day. I think for entrepreneurs too, the larger that 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 mission is, that drive, that pull, yeah, it inspires your entire team to get behind it as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Char, I'm so grateful that we've had this conversation. Thank and you. I I know that the audience would love to be able to reach out to you. How? What's the best way that they can get in touch with you after this episode? So our our main channel of communication is Instagram. That's where we're most active. Just go to Instagram, type Bashar Jika too. Just make sure it's the one that's got 2.6. Probably by the time you watch it, 2.7 million followers. Yes. Because there's like 15 <laughs> different people yeah. trying to uh, be me and scam people. Unfortunately, yeah. uh, so it's the one that's got millions of followers. Follow that. You know, we post four or five times a day there. You can learn more about what we do, what BJK University is about. Mm -hmm. But Instagram is the place. Instagram is the place. Yes. Bashar, thank you so much for, thank you, for, man. for being here and sharing so genuinely. I, I'm, I'm definitely transformed just for having this conversation. So well, I appreciate you. it. Thank you for the invite. And guys, 
you, I know, got a significant amount of value out of it. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button because you're not going to want to miss what comes next. Can't wait to see you on the next episode. Bye for now. Shar, this is amazing. Cool, man. Thank Appreciate you so it. Much. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, goodness. All right. Get up and, and shake up Get a little bit. <laughs> I appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. This was incredible.